Todd Labrador is the only practicing Mi'kmaq canoe builder, period. His canoes are housed in several major museums, not only in Canada, but also in France. He's something of a cultural archaeologist, a time traveler, seeking to learn, understand, and preserve the knowledge and worldview of his ancestors, who lived sustainably on the east coast of Canada for millennia. Todd is also an artist who paints and makes traditional drums, decorated with designs derived from the ancient petroglyphs carved in the rocks of his Nova Scotia homeland. His father, Charlie, was raised by his own grandfather, Joe Jeremy Labrador, who was a master of Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge and traditional crafts. Joe Jeremy continues to serve as Todd's guide and inspiration. For the conclusion of our Green Rights film, we needed a shot of an authentic native canoe moving along companionably with a lovely European vessel of similar size. Todd very generously agreed not only to provide the canoe, but also to paddle it on the Wildcat River while I rode beside him in a beautiful lapstrake dinghy loaned to us by the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic in Halifax. It was a profoundly moving experience. If we were setting out to build a canoe like this one, where would we start? What do we, what do we have to have? What do we have to do? Well, anybody that knows me uh, knows that I love apprentices because digging roots in the forest is really difficult. So, uh, so you go out in the forest and and all this uh, on the edge here, the spruce root. So there's a lot of, lot of work digging the roots in the forest. Uh, but uh, I guess I, I got ahead of myself. I, of course you need um, the birch bark. It, it's, um, it's without the birch bark, um, you know, you don't have a canoe and it's not just any birch. It's a special thickness and quality of a tree. And it, and it doesn't have to be a huge tree. It can be, um, you know, I've used pieces eight inches in diameter, but the bark was nearly a quarter inch thick. And most trees, the bark is paper. So, um, so it's a matter of finding, you know, I, I always say if the quality is good enough, it can be the thickness of a loony, um, eighth of an inch or so, and then you can build a canoe. So, so that would be the thing we'd have to, um, we'd have to uh, find the tree, um, plan ahead. I, when I do this, I, I like to plan way ahead. Because uh, um, harvesting times is winter bark. It's a certain time of year you harvest winter bark. Summer bark is another time, usually in July or late June when the fireflies come out at night. Once you see the fireflies, that tells us that uh, the bark will peel for summer bark. So. Well, how do you tell? How do you, so we're, I guess our first thing is we're out walking in the woods together now, yes. right? And what are we looking for? We're looking, what, would, what would make this birch tree different from that birch tree for this well, purpose? Uh, how would for, you know? For me, um, I'd, I'd like to have a, a fairly good diameter tree that's clean. Yeah, I, it's fairly clean, no limbs. And uh, if you can go 20 feet with no limbs. Um, now the tree might look good, um, and it's not necessarily a white birch. I call it a gray birch. My father, <coughs> great-grandfather, who was a builder, um, he always said, look for the gray birch. And growing up, I thought, well, there's no such thing as a gray birch. It's only white birch. But after 40 years, I, I now know there's gray birch. <laughs> so I look for the gray birch. But to look at that tree, I can't tell how thick the bark is. So I have to make a little cut in the in the bark and check the thickness of the of the bark. And if it's uh, bark is thick, the weather is right, uh, the temperature is right, and then you can harvest that tree. You know, so, um, but I might check, you know, a hundred trees before I find one. You know, and uh, depending on where you are, I might check. Um, 200, 300 trees, you know, depending on where you are. And today it's very difficult to find uh, trees. Um, I work with an elder in Minnewaukee, uh, Quebec, and I built a canoe with him back in 2004. He was 90 years old. And um, we went to look for bark. We come back, he was pretty sad, and, and they asked him, what's, what's wrong, William? He said, all we found was stumps. 
He said, that's all that's left out there with stumps because they had been all cut. So, so um, and he used to see all the birch going on the, on the trucks and he would say, oh boy, that would have made a canoe. So, so things like that, so. It's quite heartbreaking. It, it was, and, and he had built over 70 canoes in his lifetime. And when I met him, he was 90 years old, and uh, it's his last canoe that we built. And, um, and um, so he'd saw a lot of changes in his lifetime. And, um, and, and you always, if you're gonna use the tree, um, kind of cut the tree down and use it, mostly the bark is not used for anything. Uh, so his thought was, well, we can use that bark. We can create, you know, uh, containers and uh, all kinds of traditional items and, and canoes. So, that's so, right, because you'd make, you'd make, in effect, a pail out of it. That's right, yeah. And um, maple syrup was collected in, uh, in birch containers and, uh, of course, water containers. And you can even boil water in a birch bark container. Can you really? It's, uh, people will think birch bark will burn so quickly. How do you do that? Well, there's, there's ways you can boil water with a birch bark container. You know, you, you can't let the flame burn, but it's the heat from the coals, and uh, there's a way to boil water. <laughs> i have to show you some time. Yeah, I'd love <laughs> to see it. I'd love yeah. to see it. Yeah. So, we're, so we've got our, we've got our birch, yeah. and, and our birch is now, it's, it's quite thick, and we've built a lot of trees to get that. Yeah. When I, but then when I look inside here, the birch is the last thing, in a sense, right? The last thing that we actually build. Yeah. What about the inter interior structure there? When, when we build a canoe, if you think of today a, 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 a wooden canvas, a cedar canvas canoe, they're built on a mold, and they're built from the inside out. You have the mold, you put the, the ribs on, you put the planking on, then you put the canvas on. The First Nations did it the exact opposite. We put the bark first, sew it all together with the roots, and then we put the planking, then the ribs. Um, so traditionally here in this area of Nova Scotia, we would have used the black spruce for the wood, uh, the ribs and the planking. Now for the gunnels, you can use spruce as well. For the thwarts, the cross pieces, any type of hardwood that's nice and straight, um, ash or birch, uh, maple, you can use. But for a canoe that's about 16 feet long. I now know that it takes about seven to eight hundred feet of split spruce root. So that's what I use, you know, I have to split. Um, and splitting a root is a, is a skill that takes time to, to develop because uh, you want to split a root at least two, three, four feet. Um, most people, when they try, they end up with six inches or eight inches. <laughs> because when you're splitting, uh, you have to split through the center, and a lot of times it'll break off. So uh, it takes patience, you know, and, uh, and some people have patience and some people don't. So, <laughs> Well, patience and labor, because you were saying earlier you, yeah. you were out in the woods there and you're having to dig up that root. In the first yes, and um, uh, there's a lot of hard work when you're digging roots. Uh, because when you go in the forest and start digging in the ground, first thing you'll notice is that there's all kinds of flies and mosquitoes. <laughs> I tried to convince my wife that traditionally that was women's work, but uh, <laughs> she caught on pretty quick. She said, no, I don't think so. But it's a lot of work um, digging, and then you bundle it up in big bundles and uh, bring it home, and then I have to boil the roots. I cut off all the little shoots then I'll boil the roots for oh, about an hour, and then the bark will come right off. And, um, and once the bark is off, you can dry the roots and keep them for years. But before you use the root or split it, you have to soak it in the water. And uh, once it's soaked for you know, an hour or so, it's pliable. And uh, then I can split it down to the right thickness that I need. Yeah. So it's a lot of work uh, uh, preparing now, I was told that my great-grandfather, who, who lived just up the river here, could build a canoe in two weeks. Now, he didn't have electric tools. He just had a crook knife and an axe. And it takes me about 
three months, <laughs> you know, and I have electric tools, so. He must have been a man of incredible skill. He, it, I have a few pictures of him, and um, his hands were huge, his fingers were huge. Um, but he made baskets and he made mast hoops for, you know, the Mr. Walters there and uh, for the sailing ships and, and built birch bark canoes. Yeah, so. Now you were saying earlier, you've got roots out here soaking yeah. in the pond here, right? Or is this the river? Yeah, this is the Wildcat River. And uh, I, um, when I bring the roots home from the forest, you can't allow the bark to dry. If the bark dries on the root, you'll never get it off. So, so you have to keep it wet. So I'll throw it in the water here and, and it'll sink. I'll bundle it up and I'll tie a rope around it and, and I'll tie it to a bush there. And um, you gotta keep an eye out because the beaver lives right across here and I've come here before to get my roots and uh, they were gone and the, the tree I tied it to was gone too, so. <laughs> And great grandfather used to have the same problem with beavers stealing his basket wood. So, <laughs> so, so I think this 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 beaver's related to the one. Yeah. So I just um, usually tie the rope here and throw my roots right here. But every morning you can see uh, you can see the beaver sticks here. We'll watch from the house and and I've actually got some pictures of this beaver. He sits right here and he, he chooses, he eats right here in some of these little sticks. This is an older one, but uh, he'll eat the bark. Yeah. So we've been watching, uh, watching my roots, make sure he doesn't take them. And over here, I have uh, the birch bark. And you can see underneath there, until I build a canoe, I keep the birch bark soaked. So it's been soaking. And uh, sometimes the beaver will go up in here, but it kind of blocked his, his trail, so. But he's, he's, uh, didn't bother the birch bark. So say the generations are coming down on both sides That's of this right. transaction, right? Yeah, so. we're both after the same material. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. we've got the birch, yeah. and we've got the, the spruce root, and we've, we've split that to, to get it to the thickness you want for each, I guess, presume a different thickness for each part of the structure right yeah this um is um you want a fairly good thick bark but along the edge here and you can see i put side panels on there mm -hmm. sometimes the tree is not big enough diameter so you have to add pieces on uh, along the gunnels you want fairly thick bark and sometimes i'll double up on the thickness there because there's a lot of pressure from the rib pushing up onto that bark and Mi'kmaq canoe has one gunnel on each side. A lot of other canoes have two gunnels, the in whale and the out whale, and the rib goes up in between. Well, the Mi'kmaq canoe is one gunnel, the bark wraps around, and all the pressure is pushing on that bark. Okay, so the bark is ramping right up over the top of the rib. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, and it's underneath this gunnel cap. And there's a lot of pressure for that rib to push through that bark. And if you don't do it properly, you will push, uh, it'll pop through. So it's little things that you got to be aware of. And I sort of learned by making mistakes. And uh, <laughs> uh, That's how one learns anything. It, it? it is. Yeah. It's a, yeah. probably the best teacher. Well, yeah. I want to come back to your learning later on, but I want to just step yeah. through the whole construction too, because yeah. then the, the inside that you have planks, and it looks to me like in, this, in the center of the canoe you have double planking. Uh, yeah, it's a um, little rounded uh, ends on these yeah, things. Yeah, and you can put your planking mostly in two sections. Sometimes we would run the planking to here, and then from there to here, and overlap in here. And then other times you could use it in three sections, uh, depending on the wood you have. You want clear wood without knots. Um, so it all depends on what you have for material. And the ribs are the same. They're clear and it's best to get straight wood because if you get a straight tree, you can split that tree and it'll follow that straight line. So you can take the half and split it again. It'll follow that straight line. You take the quarter and split it and keep splitting it until you get pieces that thick. So it can all be split without a saw, all be split. 
Is that how you've gotten these planks here? No, this one, the grain is not very good. It's cross grain. Uh, the, the wood in here is not the best. Hard to find good straight wood. And so when you have cross grain, the bandsaw helps. <laughs> so I use the bandsaw on this one. Now what's this, there's, an, and what, much, what, what uh, kind of wood is that? Is that spruce? Uh, in here, uh, this is actually cedar from New Brunswick. Um, in this area, we would have used spruce, um, and, and you could use spruce, the black spruce is the best. Um, right now, I have uh, friends in New Brunswick where I, I'll go and get cedar. And, and, and for example, using cedar, I make a lot of drums and I'll bend the hoops, like great grandfather made mast hoops and he would steam them. When I use spruce, I, I have to soak the wood for a week or two and I'll steam it for 30 minutes and then I'll bend it. And, and occasionally it'll break, but uh, now if I was to use cedar, I don't have to soak it at all and I steam it for three minutes. So the difference in cedar is it's incredible. So um, uh, it speeds up the time, and uh, you know, and cedar's lighter. So uh, so I use cedar when I can. Yeah. And the and the ribs. These are cedar as well, and uh, the gunnels and the gunnel cap is is spruce. And of course, uh, I think these are ash. Uh, the thwarts are ash. Yeah. So there it is, and it's held together with, with it's stitched together, yeah. right? Yeah, it's all stitched together. Now I can take the ribs out, and I can take all the planking out, and I can do any repairs I need, and I can put it back together. Uh, that's the way they're made. The only thing on this canoe that's not uh, traditional is, is, the, uh, is the sealant, and you'll see the, uh, the seams are had that black seal on the outside here. Yeah. Now traditionally, great grandfather would, would have used um, spruce gum, and like the sap from the spruce tree, a little bear fat, and usually charcoal from the fire. Mix it all together and heat it up, and you can spread it on where you join two pieces of bark together. Or if it has a hole, you can spread that on, and it'll uh, it'll make it watertight. Um, if it's in the sun, a really hot sun, the gum will actually soften up and, and, and it can melt if it's not done properly. So today I use the synthetic stuff. I don't have to worry about it melting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's the only thing yeah. that you're not gathering from the forest. That's right. And um, even the gunnel caps, I have wooden pegs. Um, because you know we drill holes and we just put the wooden pegs in, and then of course on the ends we we use some roots. And uh, at the end of the canoe, there's really n no ribs up there, so the end of the canoe is stuffed with shavings. So it it gives it a little bit of um, you know support because other than that it's just birch bark. So if you got an internal piece that's wrapping around like this, the yeah, seams. it's on the outside of the bark. It's two pieces on the outside, and the bark is sort of in between and. And I have a little piece of ash one side and the other, and it's sandwiched, and then I just wrap the roots all and the way around. stitched all the way around to hold yeah. the, whole, the yeah. whole thing together. Yeah. And the, the shavings to give, it, to give it a little body. And it's really nice. Uh, these canoes are very light. Um, and for this area, uh, the rivers and streams, portage was important. And so you could pick the canoe up and just walk down the trail. And... Um, and uh, you know, carry your canoe, which is very light, and then and continue on. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's striking how light it how light it is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's a, yeah. What's what what's what I'm thinking as you're talking is, in a sense, there's a whole organic process here. You start with the with with the trees, a variety of trees, various parts of the trees, the, the stems, the skins, the roots, all of that, and then you, who are a native of this place, also. Yeah. And that combination yields this yields this boat. It's almost as though the boat grew out of this place. It is. It's a. Uh, it's um, and I don't know here in Wildcat the last time a birch bark canoe was built before me. Um, my father was born in 1932, 
Now he said he was about five years old when he remembers the last canoe that great grandfather would have built. And um, so that tradition here was pretty well lost until, uh, until I got the interest after hearing the stories uh, about great grandfather. And <clears throat> it took a long time to, to gather the information and, and, um, and, and learn the skill because it's difficult to learn how to bend a piece of wood from a book because when you, the book will tell you this, but you can't feel that tension. You know, when you're bending a piece of wood, you feel tension. Well, in a book, you can't feel that. So it's something you have to learn yourself and, and the material will teach you. Because if you're not using that material with respect, it'll break. And uh, it's the best teacher. So, um, you know, I was uh, 10, 12 years old when I, when I became interested. And, um, you know, it's been, you know, 30, 40 years of, of learning. And for me, it was a hobby and a passion, I guess, that I just had the interest. So it wasn't about uh, building canoes for a living or making money. It was about something I loved to do. And the history of great grandfather and the history of our ancestors here in this on these rivers and lakes and uh, so um, you said yeah. hearing the stories yeah tell me what this what are the stories well my father um, my father's father went to World War one and um, he died when my father was very fairly young when he came back from the war he only had one leg and so my great-grandfather, Joe Jeremy, was one who raised my father. So my father was uh, very little, but so he grew up around basket making and canoe building and things like that. So um, great-grandfather died in 1961. I was born in 1960. But my father kept telling me these stories about when he grew up and what he used to do and what great-grandfather used to do. So I heard all these stories. And my father would take me in the woods and show me how to get birch bark. And he'd show me how to get spruce roots or show me the plants and the medicines. So I learned those things. I was just really interested. So, um, um, and now I seem to be passing that on and teaching, like my grandchildren or, or anybody else that wants to, to learn. So I, now I get to the point where the elders are saying, well, if you have that knowledge you have a responsibility and the responsibility is if you have that knowledge you have the responsibility to pass it on so that we can keep it going so um, I didn't start out that way thinking that's what I'm going to do <laughs> well right. as a young man you're not an elder that's <laughs> right that's you, know? <laughs> you get so, to be that after all these years of experience right yeah. so uh, and the more and the older I get the more I realize how very important this is, but also respect, respect of everything, respect of the wood, respect of the birch, respect of uh, the roots, and respect of the traditions and culture, and uh, and in respect, that I, I when I harvest anything, I make the offering of tobacco to ask permission for the tree so that I can use it in a respectful way. So the thing is to try to use all of it, try to use all the tree and, um, and uh, to respect the tree in that way. So, so that's my goal. Sometimes I'm not able to use all the tree, but um, I would prefer if I could, you know, use all the tree. Yeah. And, and saying that sometimes they'll, the landowner will allow you to take the tree and sometimes they won't. And sometimes they'll allow you to take the bark and things like that. So, so um, the goal is to try to be respectful and use everything because our ancestors did that for thousands of years. And, and I always say, yeah, our ancestors lived right down there. Go down there and tell me where they damaged anything. They didn't, they, they used what they had to, what they needed, and uh, they respected it. And, uh, 
a little different than today. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, yeah. But as you speak, I'm thinking to myself, I've heard this from, from other First Nations people. And, and if I had to, to choose one English word that seemed to go close to the heart, of your culture, your people's culture, the word would be respect. Yeah. It seems to me that that yeah. comes up over and over again. Right. And it's almost like you're, like with, when you're talking about bending the wood, it's almost like you're listening to it. You're, yeah. you're, you're, yeah. you're waiting for the wood to speak to you through your hands and tell you when it's enough and when it's ready and when it's not ready. Right? That's, that's so well put. Uh, and, and another thing today is um, we're, we're, a lot of our people are trying to relearn things um, and sometimes they're they want it so much that they're not listening so when you're waiting for that wood to talk to you you really have to be listening and if you're not listening it's gonna break <laughs> so so you have to learn how to listen and how to uh, you know uh, understand that energy of that wood because uh, and that takes a takes practice and a skill and uh, and some people are so excited, they want to bend that wood, but they're not willing to have the patience to listen. And uh, so it takes time. Terribly satisfying, though, when you get it right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's, uh, you know, and, and I can, people will say, well, how, it's amazing how you can do that. And I'll say, well, my first canoe didn't look like that one. <laughs> it's like my first drum was bent and warped and... Um, but you know, you, you start and if you're patient enough and interested enough over time, all these material will speak to you and they'll teach you and they'll show you what to do and what not to do. And, and, uh, so it, it's nice to have a teacher and, um, I would have loved to have my father teach me more or my great grandfather here sitting so I could ask him questions. But I guess, you know, if you don't have that, do you, the material itself will still teach you if you allow it to and, and you listen. It'll teach you. Well, you also listen to the canoes of the previous builders, right? That's I right. mean, you've spent a lot of time just studying them and saying, how does this work? How is this put together? And yeah. There's a few books that were written uh, by people. And, and if I can see a picture, I can look at a picture and say, oh, that's, that's how they did it. And a lot of times you learn from a picture. I have probably four or five pictures of my great-grandfather. And the one picture, he's sitting in an old chair um, that he had just finished. And the chair, the, the arms were roots of the wire birch tree. So they had burls on the ends. And the back of the chair was basket, uh, ash strips woven into the, for the seat. So if you look carefully, at those pictures, you can learn from those pictures. And sometimes I'll see his crooked knife or his draw knife. Um, sometimes great-grandfather, when he made a basket, he, he would sit right on the ground. He would sit right on top of all the shavings, and that's how he'd work. And uh, so he's really connected to the, to the earth, you know. He didn't sit on a chair like we do today. <laughs> he'd just sit right on the ground, and that's how, where he was comfortable. Well, in a sense, you're the beneficiary of a rather tragic situation because your grandfather, coming back from the war, yeah. his life was ruined, basically, yes. by, the, by all of that, and he didn't yeah. live that long. Mm -hmm. So then your father gets raised by his grandfather. Yeah. And that's why your father knows all the stuff that people of his generation presumably wouldn't have, yeah. mostly, right? And, and not only that, um, my father lived right here for a lot of years, but when, when the Indian agents came to get all the children to send them to residential school, my father was hidden in the woods by my great grandfather. So when the black car would come on this reserve, um, the few children that were here would run and hide. And they would hide out in the woods so they, they could never catch them. Because if they caught them, they would send them to Shubenakati. And um, then he would have lost that culture. But because he didn't go to residential school, he, he was able to keep uh, a lot of the tra traditions and culture. And uh, so, uh, and being raised by great grandfather. Yeah. yeah, so he has a pipeline back into the past. That's right. And he doesn't get destroyed as so many people did by that. Yeah, so, uh, 
so you know you have to look at the both sides where some it's not good in some ways in other ways it it you know it works out and yeah well good fortune for for us for you because you're you you you've almost the knowledge is almost gone yes but there's enough left that you can go back and in a sense you can kind of pull That's it back right. yeah. you know my goal now is, and has been for quite some time, is that every canoe I build, I'd like to build and invite people to come and watch or come and learn and come and help. And um, so, you know, I, I built them at different places. And uh, for example, when, you, when you're working at the museum building a canoe, a lot of times you don't get a lot of work done <laughs> because you're always talking with people and explaining things and uh, so when a canoe should have taken you certain length of time to build a lot of times it takes a bit longer because you're <laughs> telling stories or listening because the neat thing about it is people will come and maybe tell you a story about your great-grandfather so that was always really really nice for me to because so-and-so knew Joe Jeremy when he was selling baskets and so he would tell me that story so to me, that's that's so valuable. Yeah, it's like a little visit with your grand, great grandfather. Yeah, huh? yeah, and I can pass that on, and and hopefully, one day put things in a book or, uh, you know, and because uh, I have a lot of photos now, because I take a lot of photos of every step that I do. Because um, I know in the future it'll be important to have photos where I only have like five of the great grandfather. I, I don't have any of his canoes. I don't have, I've never seen one of his canoes, so. so yeah. then, do you think any of them exist? Or are they I don't think they probably do, but I, I see a lot of photos of old canoes mm -hmm. in the local area that, that could very well have been his canoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but I don't know, you know. If, yeah. he were, if he were here now, what would be the first question you'd ask him? Oh. So many. <laughs> um, what would be the first five? <laughs> you well, know, don't, don't to me. I'm just um, curious to know what it is that you feel you would still. Oops. I was I was doing something the other day, and I was thinking the same thing. Wouldn't it be nice to just ask him? But now I forget what it was. Um, probably just little things. You know, little things that I mean I do it, but. I just sort of taught myself, you know, like uh, where did he, where did he split, where did he collect roots, and what was the, what was the land like? Where he, I know that you should get into an area that's fairly flat, and mostly spruce trees. It's hard to find that around here because there's all the mixture, and there's rocks and things. Um, I'd probably ask him, you know, when, when he built his last canoe and uh, things like that. I know he lived in the States for a while because my great-grandmother died in Highgate Springs, Vermont. That's where she died. And uh, so there's a lot of questions. I know he built a canoe one time. He went to work in New Brunswick. So he built a canoe and, and they paddled across the Bay of Hyundai. And he worked over there in Sussex. And then uh, when he came back, paddled back, and then he sold his canoe as soon as he landed on the on the shore, out in Digby or somewhere. And uh, so it would have been interesting to paddle across the Bay of Fundy in a canoe. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, things like that. So. How different would that canoe be from one of yours? Would, would it be a lo whole lot bigger? Would it have a lot higher freeboard? Or? Um, well, According to the old pictures that I see, the tumble home was one thing on a Mi'kmaq canoe, and, and the tumble home was on the side. Like most canoes will go straight up on the sides. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the Mi'kmaq tumble home, they were curved, so they went out. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that I don't know that I would probably ask him. How did he get tumble home? Because mm -hmm. how do you make your sides of your canoes go out? And um, so that's the one thing I'm still learning. So he presumably would have had to stitch a kind of a baggy patch on the side of in the bird. No, nope, no, it's uh, the, the, the canoe when you're building a canoe, the, the side of the bark goes down 
the sides and then straight across. So you like flatten the bottom straight up. So the tumble home, from what I learned, is to do with the rib. Because you bend the ribs prior to putting them into the bark. So the ribs have to be really curved. And when you're putting them in, the gunnels will actually go down and the sides go out. Oh, okay, so you haven't actually changed the, the, no. the birch. The it's, bark. Just the, it's just the axle rib. But when you're bending a rib, it'll stay around. But the rib has, wood has a memory that it wants to straighten. <laughs> so the thing is to, to keep that wood rounded. Now, how he would have done that, did he use green wood? Did he soak it? Did he heat them? Different things, I would ask him that. Mm. You know, because um, the last canoe I built last summer ended up with nice tumble home. So I, I think I'm starting to learn. <laughs> <You know. laughs> he always told us, he said, uh, you know, if you walk in the forest, you'd see all the different trees, the hemlock, maple, birch. He said, they're all living together, but they're different. But under the ground, if you could see beneath the surface of the ground, you'll see that they're all holding hands. They're all supporting each other. And he said, you know, <clears throat> we as human beings need to do the same thing. Regardless of color of skin or race or religion, we need to do what Mother Nature is speaking to us all the time, telling us these things. Our ancestors knew that. And over the time, we sort of lost that connection. Some of us still know that, but, um, you know, some of us hear it and some of us don't, you know. But I think if we listen more carefully to Mother Nature, things would go a lot better. You know, that, that remark reminded me, of two, it took me in two directions. One of them is there is a, a scientist at UBC named Suzanne Sumard. Mm -hmm. who has done some studies of, of the, inter, the interchange between roots under the ground. Yeah. And she finds that if one tree is getting too much, or getting plenty of sunlight, yep. it will actually take those nutrients and transfer it to a completely different species of tree living in the understory that doesn't reach the sunlight. So it's helping the other one. Yeah, that there's a whole community. That, yep. when, when research was published in the, in the Globe and Mail, the Globe referred to it sniffily as communist trees, you know, <laughs> sharing with each other in this way. But that's astonishing, you know, and... Yeah. But your father already knew that. He already knew that. And now we're only finding it out from a scientific way. You know, he told us another story because we used to ask him questions and um, he never always answered right then and there. Sometimes it was a week later because he would always think and he would ask the ancestors. And so one, one day we asked him, you know, all these whales are washing up on the shore and, and they're dying and, and the trying to push them back out in the ocean and they keep coming back on the shore and and they'll study them and they'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with that whale. It was healthy, there's nothing wrong with it. Every now and then one got struck by a boat and it died. But why do these whales, healthy whales, wash up on shore? So he said, well, two weeks later he came back and he said, well, I know the answer. He said, the, the whale is the chief of the sea. It is the largest animal out there. It is the spokesperson for everything that lives in the, in the ocean. It's coming up on shore, giving up its life, trying to tell us human beings a message that we need to stop polluting the ocean because they can't survive. And he said, that's what the whale is telling us. And, but a lot of people are just trying to shove it back out and, and not understanding why the whale is, is dying sacrificing this life to tell us, you know, what's going on. And a lot of things are doing that. And some people are starting to listen, but not enough, <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, the second thing that, that your father's story tells me, and it's right in line with the story about the whales, is, is yeah. we interviewed at one point a wonderful Ojibwe uh, yeah. legal scholar named John Burroughs, who you may have run into. Um, and John says, talking about the indigenous systems of law, that you derive law, you derive principles of behavior, you derive your understanding of proper be, you know, the proper ways to act by watching the natural world around you, which is exactly what your father is saying yeah. here, isn't it? Yeah. That it's not just that the trees are living together, the trees are also telling us yeah. this is the way one goes about. Yeah, exactly. And uh, 
we really need to get back to that. You know, we really need to get back to listening to, to their environment. Um, because, you know, like we were always told that, that if we don't, we're, we're, we're damaging our mother. And, you know, and then over time, our mother needs to heal. And our mother heals in a different way. She, she you know, she heals by burning, by earthquakes, by flooding, by tornadoes. That's her way of healing. And it's really going to affect us because, I mean, we're going to go through those fires and earthquakes and tornadoes and, and floods. And it's happening now. You know, it's just, our earth is telling us things need to change. And, um, and some of us know it, but a lot of people don't, don't know it. And, you know, it's going to get pretty rough. Uh, you have more extreme weather now. You know, you have extreme weather and, and different patterns that, uh, like, like I was saying earlier, that once I would get winter bark, at one time, when winter bark was ready, you could go get it. Now it changes from day to day. It changes to winter bark, to it won't peel, then summer bark, it's, it's strange. And I could really see that uh, the trees are different and, and part of the tree will peel and the rest of it won't. I've never, you know, when we were kids, when the tree peeled, it peeled. But now it's changing. It's kind of strange. If we come back to that business of listening, mm -hmm. what I'm hearing is, is you're saying that in a sense you're listening to the entire world around you, yeah. right? You're, you're, not, you're not just listening to the material, you're not just listening to the trees, but you're trying to listen respectfully yeah. to the whole That's environment right. in which you find yourself. Everything, everything. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's very, Mother Earth is very sensitive. And she'll change very quickly if if we do something wrong. Uh, we'll see a result. It may not be good, but um, clear cutting is one. You know, like clear cutting. Um, you open everything up. You know, it's like we always say. Uh, there's a whole community out there. In the forest is a community, and. Um, They'll say, well, we'll replant, we'll replant. Well, you know, it's like I've been told by elders that one tree may be the grandfather or grandmother, but that grandmother or grandfather tree is supporting a whole community underneath it. The plants, the medicines, the insects, the little animals. So you can replant a tree, but you'll never put back that community that was there. You know, it's it's changed. So um, so you're not only taking that that tree, you're taking the whole community that so depended on that tree. You know, so uh, so yeah. And you're doing that because of a very simple view of what the forest is. You see, the forest is just trees, money, which is just lumber, <laughs> which is money. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. and you're not really listening in a sense. No, it's uh, you're not listening and. And we're not using things wisely, and uh, and we waste so much, you know. So, I it, here's another thing that I keep on finding myself thinking is that in order to understand the world you're in, as you do, uh, um, you have to have been here for a very long time, and to have and to have received the understandings that are coming down from your. You said he would ask the ancestors. How would he do that? Well, in our in our beliefs in our culture, um, uh, we we always know that everything has a spirit. Everything, trees, rock, grass, insects, animals. So we're always aware of the spirit that's watching us and all around us. And they'll they'll help us too if we want if we ask for help. So. We believe that um, when we when we die, you know, we go into the spirit world. You know, I can't really see my father sitting here, but in my mind, in my my thoughts, 
he's here watching us. Great grandfather's here watching us. So, so what I will do sometimes is if I have a question, I'll, I'll ask him to myself. I'll just quietly think in my mind, you know, Dad, how did you do this? A day or two later, maybe a week later, or maybe tonight in a dream, it'll come to me. In my mind, that's how he speaks to me. Like, so my father would do the same. He would ask the old people who had passed on, and it might be a week, two le weeks later. Because they may not give you that answer. They may make you go out and try things and learn the hard way. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, someday, all of a sudden it pops in your mind. That's how you do it. So that's how we, that's how we uh, think. And, um, and it's hard to, hard to explain to people when I walk through the forest of what I see and what I feel. But I think you're right. It's, it's part of me has been connected here for thousands of years. And um, it's, it's different, you know, uh, when, when you have that connection. I, I think it's a good thing. No, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Can you try to tell me what you, what you think and what you feel when you walk through the woods? I just, for me, it's, I'm home. I'm, I'm, it's a comfort. It's a security protection. But I mean, I can look and I, I know what I can do with that. And if I need something, I know where I might be able to find it or if it's a medicine or if I need food. It's, it's all here. And um, so that's what I see. And if, and I'm always looking. So if I go through and might find a birch tree. So I'll know a year later if I need something. I know exactly where it is and where to go get it. If I find a burl or some medicine, I'll know. Like the other day I was talking to a lady at the museum talking about Labrador tea. I know exactly where I can go get some Labrador tea. I know exactly where it is. It's out the road down the railroad tracks. And when we have our little event, I'll go pick some Labrador tea. Uh, in some ways, it's almost like going to the store, you know, what part certain things are, you know, okay, the, this is over in this section, that's in this section. When I walk through the forest, I remember those things and I'll know, okay, I know where that burl, burl is. If I want to make a wall test game, I'll go get that burl. Or if I know where that straight ashes that I'm going to make a basket. Uh, so that's what I do. I, you know, it's like, uh, but if I don't need it, I won't take it. I'll just leave it. And maybe I'll never take it. Maybe somebody else will, you know, but, uh, or if somebody needs something, then I can say, I know what that is. Or if you need, um, you know, if you need a med medicine, gold thread, there's lots of it here. Um, I know where I can send you to get what you need and things like that. But it's a comfort. I guess when I go through here and the rivers to know that my ancestors lived right down here or maybe I'll be up the river and uh, my father went up the river by the falls and and uh, he sat on a rock and overlooking the falls and he said he told me the story he said I thought to myself if I was an old Mi'kmaq person, a thousand years ago, and I had my stuff, my arrowheads, what would I do? Where would I put them? He said, well, I might put them right here, under this rock. So he said, he reached down under this rock and he was digging. He pulled out a big spear point. He came down and I was 10 years old. He told me that story. Well, when I was old enough to go up the river by myself, I found that rock. I dug around and I found 14 more arrowheads. And uh, the archaeologists dated it three to 5,000 years. Uh, we found many. I found a trade axe up there that had been 1,700 trade axe. And, um, you know, so to know that my relatives put that stuff there, pretty special you know, for me. Yeah, very, very special, and to know that they they fish there, that's where they speared their salmon, right there. Um, those things are, I don't know, it's very, very special to me. Yeah. For you, there's no such thing as wilderness. No, it's uh, <laughs> right? it's all hope. It's uh... 
it's very comforting. I think the farther back I go, the more comfort comfortable I feel. Um, like my daughter said, it's uh, it's a great place to get connected in this world of disconnect. <laughs> yeah, she said that, and it makes sense to me. I've also heard people say that they have a sense of freedom in the forest that yeah. they don't have anywhere else. That's right. You don't have the energy in a house when you flick on that switch. There's an energy that comes from that electricity. You'll find much better energy out here. <laughs> and you don't have to turn on that switch. It's already on. Um, yeah, it's a much, much more comfort for me. Um, I think it's it's better for everybody if you take the time, if they take the time and go into the forest, sit down and just realize what's around them. This year I found more bird nests than I've ever found and, and are really nice to see. I found partridge eggs. The other day I had six partridge eggs. A lot of the uh, snipe birds um, nesting. Um, yellow flicker nests. There's a lot of nests this year. It's nice to see. But uh, when you walk into the forest, I always, you always be careful because uh, you never know what you're going to step on. And I always say when you walk into the forest and you get startled by a bird, it's a very good sense uh, that there's a nest right in front of you. Because the bird won't startle you unless it feels threatened. And if it's on that nest of eggs, it'll stay there unless it feels threatened. And then it'll fly away and it's like, it's only a few feet in front of you. So if you look carefully, it's probably a nest right there. A lot of times what I do is I just back away. And, uh, but if you look carefully, you'll see the nest. Sometimes one bird will leave and appear to be injured to draw you in that direction. And the other bird will stay on the nest. It's so, so incredible. Uh, it's um, so rewarding, you know, to see those things. Yeah. Yeah, that's that whole community you were talking about earlier, isn't it? It is. It's, 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 it's all out there. And, and a lot of times I'll see nests at the base of a tree. And uh, they'll, they'll sort of be at the base of a tree. Like the partridge, she, she was at the base of a tree. So that tree was her protection. And again, if we cut that tree, you know, that's some of the communities that we disturb. Yeah. If we go back to where our ancestors might first have met, and my ancestors look at the land and say it's property, and they start dividing it up, that must have seemed incomprehensible to your ancestors. Does it still seem strange to you, this, uh, this many generations later? Well, I think what it does to me is just concerns me. Like... Um, it, it's concerning that, you know, the property is... Sometimes you have a beautiful piece of property that you can't, you can't ex, you know, experience because it's private. <laughs> so things like that, uh, you know, um, and or, or these big companies will buy it up and, and destroy it. Those things, you know. Um, I mean, I... I I guess when I walk on the land, it's like there's no lines. It's no no lines. It's just land, and that's what I like about it. But um, when it's divided up in lines, painted, and yeah, that's that's you know, it's the world we live in today, and it it's um, concerns me, and it it kind of scary in a lot of ways because of where we're going. You know, because we're losing more and more of this. And just when you think there's no more to, to lose, we lose more. And so I think we, we've reached a point where we need to, you know, stop. And, and we always think, you know, we need more. We need more. We need more people. Well, I think we have enough people. <laughs> because, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of places when we grew up it was nobody now there are houses and roads and things like that and we we can all say that because I know land where you you think there would be 
nobody ever be here. Well, now there are there are houses and you know cottages or whatever, and so those things um, it makes you concerned about what's going to be there for the grandkids and great grandkids, mm -hmm. things like that. Well, there's a curious sense in which the, the people who are coming and building the houses feel that they are, in a sense, acquiring wealth. Yeah, yeah. But from the perspective you've been describing, they're actually losing wealth. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to put a price on this, you know, and I don't think you ever should. Um, you know, because uh, I have often walked down here and from up there and looked here you know this is all reservation if this was somewhere else it would be worth a million dollars <laughs> but to me it's it's worth it's you can't put money on that i mean just to walk down here and see this there's a feeling that money can ever buy um for me it's like healing it's medicine you know and i think i think a lot of people could uh benefit from that and I think some of them are, are trying to like get out into the forest and and just leave the um, you know the hustle and bustle of the city or, or, or community or town and you you can you can reconnect if, if you really want to you can reconnect um, so yeah it's uh, for me this is very special and um, it's nice to keep things like this and to keep them for our future because we need to or we're not going to have much. Like a lot of our national parks now are islands. They're just like the boundaries, up to the boundaries, they're clear cut. And there's little clump of trees and that's the national park. So, and, uh, so you can see that all across Canada now where you come up to the boundary and then, then there's trees. Beyond the boundary, it's all clean cut, so. Yeah. This being a reserve, if we come back to your father, it strikes me that your father was quite a great man, you know, a great servant of his own people and, uh, and a great leader. And uh, am I right in understanding that you probably wouldn't have a reserve here if he had not worked so hard to get the, his band organ recognized as a? Well, I, I don't know if they would have ever um, taken the reserve uh, possible, but uh, this was established in the 1840s. This thousand acre land uh, is actually more than a thousand acres, but it wasn't, uh, it was a reserve, but there was not recognized. So back in the 70s, late 60s, he, he, got, he got together with some people and, and they said, well, we need to form our own band because it was just land that people were living on. It was a reserve, but there was no, no uh, real structure. It wasn't, nothing was happening. So, so my father got together with uh, a few people and they, um, they said, well, we need to have a chief and council. So they went through the process and they said, okay, we're gonna have this person as a council member, this person as a council member, and we need a chief. So there was two of them, my father and another guy. So they flipped the coin and he won. So he became chief. <laughs> but back then there was no money. So to be a chief, you know, you need money. <laughs> so a lot of the other chiefs throughout Nova Scotia said, well, come to our meetings. And after time, you know, maybe things. So we did. So my father would, uh, would go and cut wood get a little money, get his old car and get some gas and he'd drive to the meetings. And, um, and when the meetings were over, the, chiefs, the other chiefs would all go in the hotels and sleep. My father would crawl in the back of his car and park down on the docks and that's where he'd sleep because he never had money for a hotel. So after quite a long time, Indian Affairs finally recognized and gave him a band number. and. Um, and that's where the Acadia, Acadia First Nation first started. So he was a chief and uh, I think the most money he ever made was $10,000 for a year. And, and uh, it's quite different now. But uh, 
but he would work in the woods and he always worked because he would feed us and um, or help people out and and um, I think he was only allowed one or two long distance calls a month so it didn't have an office the office we had was in our house and we know the phone would ring a lot because there's people calling all the time and uh, as little kids um, he did a lot and he never had any uh, band manager didn't have any uh, audit you know he had to do all his own paperwork so he put a lot of effort a lot of his own time I remember you know three o'clock in the morning him still being up doing paperwork and uh, nobody ever knew that but he he did a lot of stuff uh, and uh, and and the old highways imagine driving from here to Cape Breton Sydney on the old highways you know <laughs> it's still like you know five seven hour drive now uh, but he used to do it on the old highways. It's twice that then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and then sleeping in your car. So. Yeah. In a Nova Scotia night. Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah. yeah. One last thing I wanted to touch on, you've, you've t but it does tie back to all the discussion we've had about the past and the ancestors. Petroglyphs, tremendously important to you. Yeah. Huh? They are. Well, what do we know about them? Where did they come from? Um, we're, we're still learning, but I mean, there's, there's a certain amount we do know about them, but some of it we're still relearning. Um, of course, we can look at some of the images and, and know exactly what they are, like the whale hunt in a birch bark canoe, hunting whale, um, or hunting caribou, or moose hunting, things like that. But then there's other symbols, and um, so. The neat thing about that, when I first went to Kedji, it was uh, back in the 70s with my father, we weren't allowed to go to these areas because it was restricted. We weren't allowed to go, so we couldn't go. So a long time, uh, and then finally we, we, we fought enough that we got the right to go to our sacred sites, actually our sacred sites. And uh, so my father spent some time there and um, and he would look at the symbols and again, you know, ask the ancestors. And sometimes the ancestors would come and uh, tell him. And one symbol there is an elaborate symbol with many, many curves and designs. And we said, you know, what is that? He said, that's the Mawiomi. Mawiomi is a gathering. And it's when people from all over come together and celebrate and share knowledge and gather and eat and uh, so he told us that but then in the 1840s that land where the main site is it was given to a, a man named Louis Luxy we didn't know who this Louis Luxy was and then then come to find out Louis Luxy had a family and his one daughter was named Kate so Katie Luxy so Katie Luxy grew up had a family her one son was named Joe. And, and then again, grew, Joe grew up and had a family. His one daughter, his name was Beatrice. And Beatrice grew up, had a family. And her son's name was Charlie, and Charlie was my father. So my connection to Louis Luxy, Louis Luxy in 1840 had a 100 acre lot, which was where the petroglyphs were. So we're really connected to the petroglyphs. So that's your direct ancestor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, my father told me it goes back past Louis Luxy to Joe Luxy. Uh, but, um, and we have a field over here where my great grandfather was born. And we just call it the old field. But my father said that's the Luxy field. And because that's where. Um, the Luxies used to live, and my great grandfather was born right over here. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, so, so over the years we've learned the connection, and we always felt the connection, but we didn't know. But of course, after a while, you learn these things, and mm. and um, now it all makes sense. <laughs> For you to use those designs in the art that you make is it pulls you right back into your. It does it, and it. Um, 
my daughter uses him a lot in her paintings, uh, the petroglyphs, designs. When I build canoes, sometimes <clears throat> I'll put them on the winter bark etchings, the hunting scenes on my canoes. And, and also when I make drums, I'll use the petroglyphs. Um, very important to us. And, um, and when you really look at it, it's an old, really old form of art. But with our, with our art today, we're keeping that tradition going. And you keep passing it on. And um, it's really Mi'kmaq art. And uh, today, that's what it is. And, and people tell me these birch bark canoes are art too. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. it's a uh, functional art. But, uh, <coughs> uh, no, but the essence of art, yeah. to me, is that it's something that you do for the love of it that's and for the love of the beauty of the thing that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. I would guess that every time you start a canoe, you have yeah. a vision of what a beautiful canoe it's going to be. And at the end of it, you say, well, it's almost that, or yep. it's, it's not quite that, you know. You can I never do it. another one, because that one, that one isn't it. Right? Maybe the next one will be better. And <laughs> you always think that way. And, uh, but, and again, you, you put your heart and soul into it. It's always hard to let them go, because a chunk, a piece of you goes with them. But it's good to see them used and, and be, you know, appreciated, so... Yeah, so that's a good thing, and and if you can give it to a, a, a museum or a community that that really appreciates. The first one that I built in 2004 uh, was for a community that it had been a hundred years since they had their last birch bark canoe. And that and this summer I'm going back to that same community and building another one. <laughs> it's almost like a big circle, you know. So. Oh, it's a... Uh, Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Todd Labrador, Mi'kmaq canoe builder, artist, and sage, a man whose work and materials grow directly out of the soil and the culture in which he grew himself. We've met and learned from a number of remarkable Indigenous thinkers and artists on The Green Interview, including Cree elder and author Edmund Matachewaban, legal philosopher John Burroughs, and Awahoon leader Santiago Manuel Valera. It's been a rare privilege, a mind-expanding experience. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Wilalan, which is Mi'kmaq, or thank you. <laughs>